welcome to part two of our video on Enbridge. Um, this video is going to focus on analysis and a deep dive into some key areas. First off, apologies for the delay. Uh, I wasn't happy with my first take, which I did maybe a week and a half ago, and then there's been so much going on, life, um, that uh, it's just taken me a while to get back to it. But, you know, with Enbridge, the, one of the troubles that I had was that there's just so many things happening with the company and so many things to get into that uh, my first take was way too long so i've tried to really focus the discussion so we will get into the weeds a little bit but in this case with a company with uh, this much going on we're going to try and really focus the discussion so i'll share my screen with you as we walk through it together and then in part three of the video we'll tie everything together with some key considerations for the stock and our bull, base, and bear case scenarios. So we're gonna review five key items for Enbridge. We'll start with their Q1 results, which are pretty dated now. I think in the next few weeks, they're gonna be out with their Q2, but it'll give you an idea of the most recent interim results. Then we're gonna go through a couple of their uh, investor presentations, a recent uh, restructuring that they announced, the MLP roll-up, and uh, leverage considerations on the balance sheet, which I think we discussed in our intro video. Followed by financial details, we'll pull up the annual report, uh, get ready for that, and management insider ownership. And then lastly, we'll, we'll finish up with valuation um, on distributable cash flow, yield, and uh, talk about the dividends. So with that being said, let's jump right into it. So Q1 results, here we go. Uh, so I've pulled up the press release here, and the first thing to note is that uh, there's just a lot going on. So if you come down here, first quarter highlights, they talk about um, some of the financial performance, but if we just skip ahead a little bit, they're talking about executing on $7 billion of new products coming into service in 2018, so they've got a big pipeline of growth projects. They're talking about the Line 3 replacement project. Now, we know since Q1, they ultimately did get the go-ahead from Minnesota along their preferred route, which was a huge positive for the stock, and stock rallied a couple of dollars off of that. They're also talking about their funding plan uh, in terms of how they're going to fund the growth capital. They've raised $3.1 billion in preferred shares. They've refinanced some debt. And they've also announced asset sales, $3.2 billion uh, as at Q1. But we know since the quarter, uh, there's been another $4.3 billion. So they've had over $7 billion of asset sales year to date, which I think has gone a long way to ease the mind of investors that there might need to be some equity dilution. Uh, management, I think, had just guided to $3 billion to $3.5 billion of asset sales for the year. So... They're already up over the $7 billion mark. So there's a lot going on, but if we just go back to the financial results, and we're going to scroll down here. Here we go. So you can see that uh, earnings, adjusted earnings, are up. And distributable cash flow up significantly. So there's a full Q1 of Spectra in these numbers. Um, and if you scroll down a little bit here, the CEO's comments, here it is. So one thing that Al Monaco noted, noted was that the liquids pipelines mainline system has had its highest ever quarterly volume. So if we actually cut through a lot of the noise here, Enbridge has had strong throughput through its pipelines and it's delivering good volume and that's translated into increased cash flow uh, in the results and I think overall the market was pleased with the results DCF per share they don't actually calculate it for you here but 2312 uh, so 2.3 billion divided by the shares outstanding gets you to about $1.37 a share and that compares to over the same period last year that compares to about a dollar three so dcf per share is is definitely moving in the right direction so that's all we'll say for q1 uh, we'll jump into some of the 
investor presentations now. We'll talk about the MLP roll-up, which was um, an unfavorable tax announcement by FERC that occurred earlier this year. So if we jump into the presentation, ultimately the the ruling by FERC, there were certain tax advantages uh, that the MLP structure had and Enbridge of course had taken advantage of that and if we just fast forward here to their structure, if you look at the current structure of Enbridge here, it's pretty complicated and complex. There's some got Spectra Energy par Partners and we've got a couple of other entities here that sit underneath Enbridge and Enbridge has varying ownership interests you can see below here 83% economic interest in, in SEP, 35% in EEP, 12% and 82% respectively and ultimately with this tax ruling it really questioned the necessity to have these entities to begin with and so what Enbridge did, and there were lots of rumors that they were going to address it, is they came out and are essentially trying to restructure and simplify uh, their corporate structure. And they've offered to acquire all of the entities that sit beneath Enbridge in the corporate structure and ultimately end up with one corporate entity much more simplified financial reporting. As we'll see when we get into the annual report, it really is difficult right now um, to make heads or tails of the accountant prepared financial statements. So the quick details, one thing that I found really interesting about this proposal is it's an all share deal. So the holders of SEP, EEP, EEQ and ENF will be taking shares of Enbridge based on a set exchange ratio and there's really no premium being offered. So if you look at, um, let's just see here, yeah, there's a small 5% premium being, being offered to ENF, but really it's based on a set exchange ratio, no premium and uh, one thing to note for some of the holders of these entities is the dividend was higher than what it will be in Enbridge. So holders of these entities will likely, in some cases, have a, a distribution cut or a dividend cut going forward. Ultimately, for Enbridge, you know, I think the simplification of the corporate structure would be a huge positive, particularly right now where there's already uh, significant noise in terms of the amount of growth projects they've got on the go, even the ability to to build and ap approve pipeline projects in the current environment, as well as um, the leverage on the balance sheet. There's just a lot going on and, and uh, if they could remove and simplify the corporate structure, I think that would go a long way. So I'm really curious to see how this plays out. I'm curious to see if Anbridge is going to have to sweeten the pot uh, to get some of these deals done. and. Time will tell. So that's what I wanted to say about the MLP roll-up. I also wanted to talk a little bit about leverage and that was one of the key considerations and I think the market's concerned about and we talked about in our intro video. I'll just pull up a slide from their investor presentation at the end of 2017. So it's a little bit outdated now. This is back from December, but I thought it just did a nice job of, of looking at the consolidated debt to EBITDA. Consolidated debt to EBITDA, anytime you're over five times, I mean, that's that's a pretty high ratio. Now, given the strength and stability of, of their business model, pipeline operators typically um, operate with higher leverage. But I think, you know, the credit rating agencies made it pretty clear that they weren't comfortable with Enbridge above the five times. And as we get into the balance sheet and the financial statement analysis, it's just not only is it a significant amount of debt from a leverage multiple, five times debt to EBITDA, um, it's also a significant amount of debt just from a pure dollars perspective. When they went out and acquired Spectra, uh, they essentially doubled the size of the company and debt now is through $60 billion. And that's just, that, that's just a big number. Um, and so management's taken note and put a plan in place to bring leverage down and that's gonna be done 
um, through asset sales as well as cash flow outside of what's being paid out on the dividend. So there's a lot going on here with free cash flow, how you're going to fund growth, but at the same time reduce leverage all the while maintaining slash increasing your dividend. Uh, so the, the real balancing act that management teams trying to pull off here. Good. So we're cruising through it here. We talked about Q1 results, MLP roll up, leverage, and now we'll jump into the financial details into the annual report. Uh, this gave me a bit of a headache. And as you will see, let me jump into it here. So when we go, I just jumped right into page 117 of a 200 plus page report and going through the income statement, statement of shareholders equity balance, balance sheet and statement of cash flows. The one thing that becomes readily apparent as we scroll down here, if you just look at the earnings per share number, this is a business that doesn't really, the, the reporting on the gap financial statements, there's so much going on here that we'd have to adjust for and back out that the headline EPS numbers don't really mean much. I mean, this this is presumably a very stable business with stable cash flows, and you've got earnings, gap earnings going from negative four cents a share up to $1.93 and down to $1.65 in 2017. If you look at the revenues here, we won't spend too much time on this, but you can see $34 billion of revenue tiny bit of growth in 2016 and then 2017 with the Spectra acquisition, um, meaningful growth. When we look at the corporate structure, that's where you're going to start to see a lot of noise um, below the operating income line. So you can see some income from equity investments down here. Uh, you've got some earnings from non-controlling interests. We also have the income tax line. You've got a huge income tax recovery here versus an expense in the previous year. So there's just a lot to chew through. And this is why management's really guided investors towards distributable cash flow per share. And uh, let's just jump into that. They actually have a su supplement, supplemental disclosure that they provide. And you have to really get into the deep pages of it uh, but on page 14 uh, you can look back on the 2017 results and essentially see how they get from EBITDA down to DCF per share and uh, so it provides a little bit of a reconciliation here um, but they are tough statements to uh, to make your way through and to illustrate my point, let's look at the changes in equity. So the consolidated statements of change in equity, I don't think I have ever seen a statement this complex when we're looking at just the changes in equity. Normally this is a fairly simple statement. And you look at all the things that are going on here. Um, that's a lot to chew through. Balance sheet, we'll take a look at quickly. Here we go. All I really want to point out here on the balance sheet is significant increase in goodwill. See the goodwill line here going up to 34 billion post the Spectra acquisition. You can see property, plant, and equipment jumping up by almost 30 billion. Again, Spectra acquisition. And then at the same time, you've got long-term debt jumping by almost $30 billion, uh, over $60 billion in debt now. And then you can see the equity base growing by a little over $30 billion as well. So they essentially doubled the size of the company and the balance sheet uh, with the Spectra acquisition. And the last thing that I want to talk about in the financial statements are the 
statement of cash flows. So one of the other things when we think about distributable cash flow, and we'll go over to their supplemental disclosure here, is maintenance capital. Okay. So maintenance capital is meant to be the sustaining capex that's required to um, to maintain existing pipelines. It's not going to drive growth in revenues and cash flows going forward. And so it's a true cost of, of doing business. Whereas if you look at the cash flow statement, capital expenditures aren't broken out between growth and maintenance capex. So you've got a meaningfully higher number. So what Enbridge management team's trying to do here is show you that majority of these capex dollars are driving growth in the future and if you go to the supplemental disclosure here we go 1.2 billion of the capex in 2017 uh, was required for for maintenance and wouldn't really be driving growth so 1.2 billion of the 8.2 billion uh, was for maintenance but again the financial statements that you see, the account prepared financials, it's really tough to decipher all of that. I mean, look at the statement of cash flows here. Look at all of the stuff that's happening. Uh, they, they issue hybrid equity, so preferred shares. Um, they've got dividends. They've got a lot of, they've got a drip program. So a lot of investors are, are dripping their dividends. So there's more share issuance or dilution, but they get that money back. Uh, to help fund growth so again just a lot a lot to get through and I guess I'll wrap it up by saying that because there's so much going on with this company um, management cre credibility is huge because ultimately in their investor presentations and their guidance they're distilling everything down to a DCF per share guidance so a free cash flow per share guidance and a dividend growth and a dividend payout ratio and with so much happening behind the scenes you have to trust management that um, you know everything that's happening to roll up into that one free cash flow per share number um, you know that that they're being candid with you and I think right now with management slightly in the penalty box, I think that's one of the key issues is there, there's so much noise and it's really tough for an average investor to look through the statements and really get a handle on, on what's happening. And so you're left having to decide whether you trust management and their guidance. And over the last year, and year and a half, again, you know, it, it, um, results haven't been as strong as they would have guided to and so I think they're a little bit in the penalty box right now and and that that may easily change with honestly with just executing and delivering results um, this this year and next so that leads us to management and won't spend too much time here, but let's just see if the CEO is aligned with shareholders. Uh, so the CEO, Al Monaco, he's been with Enbridge since 1995. So we've got someone here with 20 plus experience in the business, um, which is, which on the surface is great. Um, he has 500,000 shares. So 500,000 shares worth about 17 million US so you know is 17 million a lot of money of course it is for a company of this size is this, is this a meaningful ownership position I'd argue that it isn't um, he does have significant stock options so if you look at 500,000 shares but close to 4 million options at 45 46 dollars a share that's meaningful so you know he's definitely aligned is it his own money at play here or are his shares just the result of option grants etc uh, again this is a big institution uh, he, he clearly compensation structure is aligned to maximizing shareholder value 
but wouldn't say that this is a significant um, insider holding. All right, so we're rolling through it. Talked about the MLP, talked about leverage, talked about the financial details, which honestly were uh, gave me a headache. And we talked a little bit about the management and the insider ownership. And so to close out, we'll talk about valuation and the distributable cash flow or the free cash flow per share. And I think one key point, and again, this goes a little bit to uh, some frustration that you might have with management and the investor relations department. You know, last year in 2017, if we jump over to the DCF per common share, here you can see it. 2016 DCF per common share, $4.08, and that decreased to $3.68 in 2017. So obviously there was significant dilution when they made the Spectra energy acquisition. They took on a lot of debt. You can see the interest expense jumping up here from $1.5 billion to $2.4. So while EBITDA went up from about $6.9 billion to $10.3, uh, with the dilution and the added debt, ultimately your free cash flow per share went down. And that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons why the stock's been under pressure. And what's frustrating here is that in, in all of their investor presentations and um, other marketing material, they really try and hide this. Like nowhere do they show this. And I think it's fairly misleading. Um, you have to really again dig into we're in the supplemental disclosure on page 14 to find this number and uh, you know if we go back to some of their fancy marketing let's just jump up here a bit just going through if I can find one of their charts let's see there we go. So again, they used to call DCF per share ACFFO, so there's been some change in nomenclature. But they really distill everything down into this nice little chart. Um, but they have they leave out the 2016 figure. You can see, that, and, and I get it, it's a bit of a marketing, you know, obviously these are marketing documents, but at some point, I would appreciate management just admitting, look, on a per share basis, Spectra, the Spectra acquisition, we took one step backwards last year. We're still confident in the future. We're guiding to, I believe they're guiding to about $4.30 of DCF per share this year. So, and the market's figured it out. It's just a little frustrating as an investor when you're trying to do your homework and they've tried to hide some of the key data from you. Anyway, rant is over. Rant is done. Uh, we're back to the supplemental package so if we if we want to look at valuation on a free cash flow per share which i think i think is fair here um then you know let's look at the figures we've got four dollars and eight cents in 2016 made the big spectra acquisition the free cash flow per share took a hit in 2017 down to three dollars and 68 cents uh, but management is guiding to about four dollars and 30 cents for 2018. So if we believe that should be a nice, a nice bounce back year and based on a share price of about $46, let me just grab my calculator. So based on a share price of about $46, 4.3 divided by 46, that's about a 9.3% yield. So about a 9% free cash flow yield for a company as large and presumably as stable um, being a pipeline operator as Enbridge, that's, that's fairly attractive. And you only have to go back, you know, maybe two years ago to when the free cash flow yield was more like six or seven percent. So it is trading at a discount valuation wise to what it has in the past. Um, one other thing that I'd point out here, there obviously is a lot of debt on the balance sheet. So when you think about a free cash flow yield, this is free cash flow to equity. Well, what if we, what if we backed it out, backed out leverage and looked at free cash flow on a, 
on an unlevered basis just to just to take a peek. Um, in this case, you've got 5.6 billion of distributable cash flow, and we'll just do rough numbers here. You add back the interest expense of 2.4, maybe about 2.5, depending on the tax. There will be obviously some tax adjustments because you won't have that shield. And that gets you to about 8.1 billion. And let's assume that's about an $80 billion market cap plus $65 billion of debt. So if you take 8.1 billion divided by 145, let me just do that quickly here. 8.1 divided by 145, you get about 5.5%. So the free cash flow yield to equity, because there's so much debt on the balance sheet here, is a little over 9%. And if you looked at an unlevered free cash flow yield, it's about 5.5%, which makes a lot of sense. And then lastly, on the dividend, dividend is currently paying out approximately 65% uh, payout ratio of distributable cash flow. That's what management's guiding towards. Um, and they're guiding towards 10% dividend growth. So without Without commenting too much on that, obviously the, the distributable cash flow or free cash flow per share is ultimately what's going to drive their ability to increase the dividend over time. They're sitting around a 65% payout ratio and that's where they believe that they're comfortable, um, which leaves remaining 35% to fund growth. And we know in the current environment, uh, based on all of the growth projects that they've got going on right now, they're going to need the 35 percent isn't going to be enough so how do they how do they get there well it's a combination of some investors dripping their dividends reinvesting their dividends it's a combination of asset sales we talked about seven billion dollars of asset sales announced uh, so far uh, year to date and and issuing some preferred shares basically doing pulling all the levers that they have available um, to maintain the dividend slash grow the dividend and fund their growth projects, which are ult ultimately going to drive uh, free cash flow growth over time. So that's it. Hope you enjoyed the analysis piece uh, for Enbridge. If you liked the video, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to Ostrich Investing, and check us out at our website or on Twitter. We'll be back shortly with part three, where we tie everything together into some key considerations for the stock and run through the bull case, the bear case, and the base case. Until then, happy investing and don't bury your head in the sand. <laughs>